Hello and welcome to this afternoon's case discussions, creative art space and how to make it happen. Discussiones de casos, espacios creativos de art space y cómo hacerlo una realidad. Today's session will be given in English, but we have translation available for those of you who would like to listen to today's session in Spanish. If you look on your screen below in the description of this session, you will find the link that will also be chatted into the chat box, which you will find above the screen in the Engage tab, and then you'll see an area for chat. Within the session, you can use that area to respond to poll questions and also to respond uh, with questions for our panelists. So without further ado, I'm very pleased to welcome the national nonprofit leader in real estate development for the arts. They have more than 53 operating developments geared to creative arts and workers. And the projects often function as anchor institutions in the communities where they operate right now across 38 US cities and 23 states and perhaps soon even the Caribbean. We listened to the US Virgin Islands concern about the preservation of culture, history and the creative arts. And that's why we brought this session together. So I hope you really enjoy it. Before we get going, we're gonna play a short video about a creative arts development that's taking place in Santurce, Puerto Rico. The video's in Spanish, but you'll see the subtitles in English. So it's about three minutes and I hope you enjoy it. Please proceed with the video. Saludos, mi nombre es Olga Villa, líder comunitaria de la comunidad de Tras Talleres en Santurce. La comunidad de Tras Talleres se forma por agricultores desplazados que vinieron a San Juan a buscar eh, trabajo, siendo el terminal del tren que tenemos al frente, donde la mayor parte de ellos trabajaron. Es por esto que decidimos rescatar este edificio abandonado para utilizarlo como un museo de la memoria. Y donde ahí vamos a recorrer y a recopilar toda la historia cultural de nuestro barrio. La situación de los edificios abandonados ha afectado grandemente a la comunidad. Primero, porque utilizan muchos de ellos como vertederos. Segundo, porque muchos de ellos están enfermos, lo cual perjudica la salud de los residentes. Eh, nos hemos dado la tarea de rescatar estos edificios para, pues, para mejorar nuestra calidad de vida. Esta iniciativa nace en el 2017 en una conversación que tuve con Marianne Ramírez, directora del Museo de Arte Contemporáneo, en el cual pues, eh, queríamos poner toda, exponer toda la cultura y de todos los artistas, músicos y todo lo que tiene tras talleres, porque tras talleres es rico en música, es rico en artistas y en profesores. Eh, y queríamos rescatar este edificio para eso, para que las generaciones futuras sepan su historia. Ha sido bien importante la colaboración y participación en este proyecto del municipio de San Juan, el Museo de Arte Contemporáneo, la comunidad, por supuesto, y Health Street. Mi nombre es Luis Gallardo, soy el director ejecutivo del Centro para la Reconstrucción del Hábitat, una entidad sin fines de lucro que provee asistencia técnica y ayuda legal a diferentes comunidades de todo Puerto Rico y también gobiernos municipales sobre la conversión de propiedades vacantes y abandonadas en activos para el desarrollo comunitario. Se estima que una de cada tres propiedades en Puerto Rico está vacante o abandonada. Aquí en Tras Talleres nada más hay como 70 propiedades eh, abandonadas. Eso crea varios problemas para la comunidad. Primero, baja el valor de las casas colindantes. Eh, además, pues también crea un problema de seguridad pública. Y finalmente también está la cuestión de la contaminación ambiental, no solamente por la presencia de plomo y asbesto, pero también las personas la utilizan de vertedero clandestino, de descargas ilícitas, de contaminantes tóxicos y cosas así. Este proyecto viene desde hace años de parte del sector comunitario, sin embargo se han ido sumando diferentes entidades sin fines de lucro y públicas, incluyendo la organización nuestra que, que llegó por invitación del museo, pero obviamente pues vamos fomentando esos lazos con la comunidad. Eh, y también la Agencia Federal de Protección Ambiental pues también proveyó asistencia para hacer unas pruebas ambientales al edificio como primer paso a la planificación y diseño del proyecto. 
Ya en esta propiedad pues, se han realizado ciertas pruebas ambientales, ya hemos adelantado bastante en cuestión de la estrategia legal para la adquisición y también la planificación comunitaria, pero lo que falta ahora es la intervención del municipio, la declaración formal de esta propiedad con un estorbo público, la adquisición de esta propiedad por parte del municipio y su, su traspaso a la comunidad para convertirse finalmente en el Museo de la Memoria de Plasta y Isn't that a beautiful vision for reuse of that site? Our colleague Sonia Cosme assisted Tras Talleres in obtaining technical assistance from the US EPA's targeted brownfield assessment program, which identified just low levels of contamination on that site. And through assistance from our colleague Luis Gallardo at the Center for Reconstruction of Habitat, uh, the community is working with the city on obtaining access and continued use of that site for its future redevelopment. So it's very positive. Right now, I'm gonna ask you to uh, join us in participating in a poll. If you look at the top of your screen, you'll find the button that says engage, touch that button, and there's a, another button that says Q&A, and you, in there, we're gonna ask you to respond to the question, what do you hope to get out of today's session on creative spaces for arts and culture? So right now, as you're answering that question, I'd like to introduce colleagues from ArtSpace. First of all, Chief Operating Officer of ArtSpace, Will Law. He joined ArtSpace back in 1992 and has worked in property development, asset management, consulting, and financial management. Among the major projects for which he has had primary responsibility are the Tilsner Artists Cooperative in St. Paul, Minnesota, the Washington Studios in Duluth, Minnesota, the Riverside Artist Lofts in Reno, Buffalo Lofts Art Space Lofts, El Barrio's Art Space, PS109 in New York. And as a member of Art Space's senior management team, Will is responsible for overseeing the organization's day to day operations. He is a graduate from Metropolitan State College in Denver, Colorado, with a bachelor's degree in art, uh, English and political science. Joining us as well from Art Space is Wendy Holmes, senior vice president of consulting in Art Space. Wendy has been active on local and national boards and regional committees, including James Sewell Ballet, the Urban Land Institute, Cantus, the Minneapolis Park Foundation, and the Merce Cunningham Dance Company. She has been a speaker at numerous national arts and urban affairs conferences, as well as guest lecturer at the St. Thomas University, McAllister College, and the Humphrey, Hubert H. Humphrey Institute of the University of Minnesota. She is a national resource for information about urban redevelopment issues and has been interviewed by many local and national publications. And if you ask Wendy what she does, she'll tell you that she and her team of five are community whisperers. She's always on the go to new places, large and small, to help figure out the puzzles that lead to equitable community development where creative people and organizations have a strong voice. Let's bring Wendy and Will on stage right now so they can begin their presentation. But before we go, I'm wondering if there are any responses to the poll question. So we can hear back from people that 86% are, um, are curious about what partners are necessary for project success. 57% are curious about how to sustain creative spaces and 75% are interested in how to fund their creation. So we'll get into those questions during the presentation and also speak about those themes uh, during the Q&A. Take it away, Wendy, and welcome. All right, thank you so much. Hola a todos. Uh, it's wonderful to be here today. And can you all see the slides? I just wanna make sure. Yes, Will, tell me if you can see the slides. <laughs> I, I can, not in a way. All right, good. All right, well, we're here to talk to you about ArtSpace. We're based in Minneapolis, Minnesota, on the mainland, but we work all over the United States. We've done several projects on islands now in Hawaii, and uh, we're also working in San Juan in Puerto Rico. So we really look forward to this robust conversation after we uh, share our, our slides with you. So I'm getting there. <laughs> 
All right. So our space uh, mission is to create, foster, and preserve affordable space for artists and arts organizations. And as I mentioned, we do that work all over the country. I'm having a few technical difficulties. I apologize for that. And we will try one more time. Bear with us. And if that doesn't work, I may ask the hosts to help us. Do you see the slide advancing? I think you do. All right, we're back, we're back. So Artspace has been around since the late uh, 70s. We were actually established by the city of Minneapolis. And at that time, artists were trying to figure out Space, where, spaces where they could live and work in the warehouse district where there were many vacant and underutilized buildings. But it wasn't sustainable because once the artists came into the neighborhood, others wanted to be there too who could afford to pay more rent. So the artists began to get displaced and they would come to this newly formed organization called Artspace to say, hey, can you help us find a space? And at that time, we were basically a broker to help individual artists and artist businesses find space. And only in one city and only in one corner of a city at that time, and an area very much like Santour Say is today in San Juan, for example. Today, we own and operate 54 projects. We can't keep up with the numbers on the slides uh, in 38 cities and 23 states. And we hope that Puerto Rico will be our first non-mainland uh, project. We'll be talking about that in a bit. And the, the buildings that you see in front of you on the slide are all historic preservation projects. And again, we'll be going into that in more detail. Uh, on the left, you see a project in the Pullman neighborhood on the south side of Chicago. In the middle, the Bell School in New Orleans. And on the right, PS 109 uh, in New York in El Barrio. So what do we do? Uh, beyond buildings, we, cre we create these buildings and we own and operate them. We also consult. We consult with arts organizations. We consult on arts districts and creative districts. We help with policy development and, and policy that helps to change the policy in favor of creative people being able to occupy space in a legal way, because in many cases, in many cities, that activity is still below the radar and artists find themselves in spaces where they're soon displaced. And I imagine there might be some questions about that at the end. This is a map of our work on the mainland. And also we have Puerto Rico now on that on that map, I'm excited to say. Uh, the economic impact of these projects is very strong. And we did an economic impact study uh, about 10 years ago to look at that, right? And the economic impact on the communities is such that we are animating underutilized and vacant or historic buildings. We're often, often putting properties back on the tax rolls that have been off the tax rolls for many years. These spaces and places and the creative people in them helped often help to boost property values. That can be a catch-22, depending on what side of the cycle a community or neighborhood is in. The artists help to foster a safer and more livable neighborhood neighborhoods. The artists often get involved in the beautification of the neighborhoods and making them feel more safe. And there's more people on the ground and paying attention to their surroundings attracting other artists and arts organizations. So creative people attract other creative people, and that's well-known phenomenon. They often anchor creative districts in an organic kind of way, not just in a sign, but also in the way that they anchor and, and encourage other creative people and businesses to occupy nearby spaces and expand public access to art so that there's more people being able to experience art. Most of these buildings have monthly or bi-monthly or annual art crawls where they're invited in to experience art uh, on a regular basis. 
And then the impact on artists from our study is about being a catalyst for the arts community and encouraging other artists to be able to create in their spaces by creating more productive environments where artists then end up being able to make more of their money through their art and not have to hold down quite as many jobs in order to pursue their creative passions. So that's a, that's a big deal that we found to be true. What are the central goals of the projects that we create? Of course, we want to meet the creative sector's space needs, right? That's an obvious one. We want to ensure long-term affordability so that artists, again, don't have to experience those cycles of displacement, which are so common, especially in larger cities, but also happens in smaller ones as well. They need to reflect the unique culture and character of the community. It's important that the culture is uh, empowered through these uh, developments and exemplify sustainable and efficient design. They need to operate in the black. Otherwise, we wouldn't have 54 projects across the country. And we do all of this work through an equity lens. So racial justice and racial equity is super important to the work that we do. Our projects include adaptive reuse or historic preservation, new construction, and the combination of the two. So when we're talking about who is an artist or who is a creative, we really want to open the door for everyone to think as creatively as they possibly can about that definition. We often learn about new forms of artistic pursuit in, uh, in each community that we work in. When we were working in Taos, New Mexico, for example, we learned about the healing arts and how important that is to think about the culinary arts, right? Things that are go beyond visual arts and uh, performing arts, all of which are important. And culture bears, we're working on the Pine Ridge Native Reservation in South Dakota, for example, and their culture bears are a very important piece of the culture there. When we're designing these spaces, especially the housing units, first of all, we're, we're building them so that they are open and flexible and create with durable surfaces and access to lots of light, right? High, high ceilings and large windows and as much flexibility as possible. And in the community spaces and the business spaces, the same is true, right? It's some of these spaces, these flexible community spaces that I'm talking about are free for the artists who live and work in the building. For some of them, there's a rent, they pay rent, but the rent is almost always below market rate. These are just some examples of some of the studios and commercial spaces in our buildings. And then I'll turn it over to Will to talk about more specifically about this giant preservation project that we did in New York, followed by the one in New Orleans. Hello, and thank you, Wendy. And um, I, I've been thinking a little bit about what I would say today, and I, I think I would share this. Um, although Artspace's mission as a nonprofit is to create affordable space for artists and arts organizations and um, for education, presentation, rehearsal purposes, I think we learned pretty early on that it was hard to do development with that singular focus. And there was also resistance to wanting to have our focus, you know, broaden, if you will, you know, and there was a lot of talk about mission creep. And um, so that was an early point of struggle. But I think what we learned early is that our ability to be successful is to identify appropriate cultural partners that may have a different central focus, but one that is complementary to ours. And we learned early that by combining uh, access to resources for a slightly expanded vision, um, we were able to be more successful. So what I mean specifically about that 
is that while we wanted to do affordable housing uh, or we wanted to do affordable space, we started thinking about affordable housing. And in the U.S. at least, there are tax credits um, and other uh, federal funds available to promote affordable housing. While not specifically for artists, we understood that we could tap those funds and mold them a little bit for our artist market. In addition to that, um, there are also federal resources in the U.S. uh, that support uh, and advance historic preservation. Now, historic preservation and those credits could kind of care less about our arts agenda, quite frankly. But what I think we discovered early on is that if you are a a person or or an organization and you are primarily focused on and interested in saving a building and historic preservation and keeping a physical asset uh, vibrant and healthy in a community, uh, while an admirable goal, it is often really hard to pull all the resources you need you need to make that happen on that agenda, if you will, alone. So we learned early on that if we could find a structure, and P- this PS109 project in New York's a perfect example, that was beloved for its uh, you know architectural and uh, historical, contributions to its community, and there was a high desire to save it, Uh, if we could figure out, if we could, you know, convince the community that artist housing and art and cultural uses were an appropriate adaptive reuse for that structure, we could then bring dollars that are there for art and cultural development in the philanthropic community, dollars that were there at the federal government to advance affordable housing, and dollars that were available through the state and federal government to preserve uh, buildings for historic preservation, if we could pool all those resources into one vision, we could find success. And if we are only going to advance one of those agendas, we would not find success. So PS109, I think, and many of our projects we'll talk about, I think the the key lesson here is to always be open to appropriate cultural partners and the resources that their agenda and or their objectives can help bring to the table. And if you can find a way to accommodate everybody's vision in your particular project, you'll have access to more resources and a better chance for success. Specifically, just to talk about this project, we had uh, federal historic tax credits, which were sold and converted to equity. We had state um, uh, housing tax credits that were sold and converted to equity. I hope I said both affordable housing on both of those. And then there were both state and federal historic tax credits that were able to be identified and used for this building, along with some significant philanthropic s- support from some big foundations. And we were able to bring this building, which was in horrible disrepair. It had sat empty for probably pushing 50 years, I think, by the time we are not quite 50, about 40 years when we finally were able to uh, uh, save this building. The upper floors had to be entirely rebuilt. But today it is just this beautiful structure and an iconic, you know, physical structure in that community. So uh, more stats about that. You know, we we also did other things. We reserved 50% of the units for current residents of the neighborhood. And and this isn't a concern in all communities, but in New York, there's real concern about gentrification and how uh, uh, communities that have been in a particular neighborhood, and this neighborhood is Spanish El Barrio Harlem, you know, a, a lo- very large Puerto Rican, very large Dominican uh, communities uh, in this area. And a lot of sort of gentrification pushing from the Upper East Side up into those neighborhoods and displacing families that in many cases have been there for generations. So there's an awful lot of conversation about, while well, we want to uh, embrace this uh, redevelopment and we want to save this building and we want to support artists and we want affordable housing. We also don't want it to be an engine that displaces families that are here. So 
we made a, a minimum commitment to set aside 50% of the units for residents that were already residents in that neighborhood. It, at the end of the day, by the way, we were closer to 75%. So we were really proud of that statistic, but that was a covenant that we agreed to when we started the project. As you can see, the pressure for these kinds, this is 99 units. We had 52,000 applications for those 99 units, which is just insane. Um, so the demand, of course, for spaces like this is pretty incredible. The rents, at least for New York City, are amazingly affordable. Um, and then there is also a combination of shared use, flexible spaces. These two pictures reflect that. Uh, that community groups and individual artists uh, can use in some cases for free, in other cases for ridiculously low kind of cleaning the rents um, to uh, advance their, their work and or their community work if, if it's not artistic. Uh, shifting gears, I guess, a little bit, uh, the same general story. We, uh, we bought a campus of school buildings, um, some public, some private, uh, post-Katrina uh, in the Treme, uh, Treme neighborhood. Uh, one of the, in fact, I think the oldest free uh, African-American community um, uh, in the country, which is an interesting historical and important historical fact. Um, so this building uh, was a combination uh, the private school was originally, of course, started with this chapel and became a nunnery and other things throughout the years and eventually was a Catholic school. And then on the adjacent block, there was a public school. Um, and we, uh, post Katrina, both fell into disrepair and were abandoned and were abandoned for a lot of years. And then we stepped in and ultimately built these 79 units of artists live work housing. There's some interesting stories that we can talk about with regard to this chapel space that you're looking at and our struggle to sort of make the resources I've described previously be flexible enough for us to, first of all, save the building, which became kind of our you know, minimum goal, um, but then to use the space as flexibly as we wanted to became very difficult. And it's a story of, you know, of limitation with regard to making complex resources work together to achieve a goal. So while we were able to save this building, um, the physical shell and structure and fully rehab it, we were not able to at least yet um, figure out how to um, facilitate the adaptive reuse of the interior in a way that is acceptable to everybody. So I think it's a good example to talk about. It is always challenging when you have uh, uh, multiple partners at the table uh, on the financial contribution side and on the ultimate use side of the building, it is sometimes very difficult to get everybody on the same page. And we have struggled in this one case uh, with this chapel. The rest of the project went great. The 79 units are serving those artists in, uh, in an amazing way. We have several nonprofit arts partners and office on the site as well, June Buck, uh, in particular, the great job. And um, so it, it is another example of, again, combining resources available for historic preservation and arts development and uh, affordable housing resources as well to save uh, in some important buildings and uh, create some badly needed uh, local resources. So when we're looking at work in a new city, we are looking at six different components of community-led development. Of course, each one of those breaks down into a lot of different steps, but we wanna just review those really quickly so that we can um, demystify this process a little bit. So a project concept, and this is PS 109, by the way, this is the grand historic school that Will was talking about in El Barrio and all, where all the windows were boarded up and it, it didn't have the copper cupolas that it now has because they were restored. Um, yeah. So when you're talking about project concept, it's important to understand uh, what a community wants. So some, many times communities, especially the larger cities, want the living and working space because 
rents are so high, right? So in New York, it was all about the housing, although space for nonprofit and community-based organizations was really important too. So understanding the project concept is first and foremost. Then understanding the arts market, how many people need what kinds of space. This is a project in Memphis where we did historic preservation and new construction. We often do those together. And we've done that maybe eight or nine times where we've taken a, an historic building and then done new construction adjacent to it, for example. Who are the local leaders who are going to carry this project forward? We really want to see and help encourage leadership from all sectors, from the private sector, as well as the public sector. It's really essential for these projects to succeed. Where are their potential sites? So in New York, for example, we looked in every borough before we landed in Manhattan. <laughs> it was quite a process. So understanding where there are potential sites, if there are city owned sites or municipally or government owned sites, it often makes things easier. And I'll explain why in a moment. Where is the funding going to come from? You know, this is kind of a typical funding stack that Will was talking about, where 70 to 75% of the funding may come from public sources economic development, transit-oriented development, other federal programs that are focused on community development, housing, historic preservation, other kinds of infrastructure. And many of these tools exist in the island nations in the Caribbean as well. And I'm sure there'll be some questions about that. Conventional financing, right? That's important, but that's a smaller portion of the total funding mix. We try not to have much debt when we're trying to keep, when we're keeping the rents as low as possible. And then philanthropy uh, occupies an important piece, but not the largest piece. It's typically anywhere from five to 20%. Uh, is, it comes from local and sometimes national uh, philanthropic sources. And then broader community goals. And I'll give you some examples of that. And this is where that alignment comes in that helps us really piece together the funding as well. What are the things that are important either in the comprehensive plan of a city or in the DNA of a community? Is this historic building, has it been sitting there for a long time and there's just tremendous passion and pressure to renovate that and that is going to get you a lot of community support, for example. Same with vacant lots that may have been there for a long time. Is it really important to support the cultural community because of displacement, for example? Same with anchoring arts districts. Is it something that has naturally started to happen and having a, a, a larger number of people in a place can really help that concept take off and encourage others to think about space for creatives in that area? Promoting tourism. These are some of the things that we think about when we're talking about those broader community goals. So now I'll turn it back to Will to talk a little bit about our work in San Juan. Well, it's a fairly new conversation. And, um, um, but what is interesting about Puerto Rico is that they do have the same access to uh, federal resources uh, in the US that all the other states do. Um, so it sort of a, a creates some unique opportunities. and. So we've been in conversations with um, various um, entities in Puerto Rico over some years, but we increasingly have sort of focused in on with, with some partners and specifically on a couple of different sites. So it's really early, so I'm, I'm, I, I don't want to say too much, but what I've learned, which is interesting, and I, and I keep asking this question, and, and so far, I have not learned of anyone who has used the uh, federal historic tax credit in a redevelopment in the preservation of a historic building uh, in Puerto Rico. I'm hoping that I'll find somebody someday that has done it, um, but I have not yet. And, um, and that strikes me as unfortunate in that it is a really 
uh, an appealing resource and could really help advance some projects that may otherwise struggle. The credit uh, is, is they often referred to as a 20% credit and it can create about 20% of your equity or close to that um, uh, for a project's you know, capital stack needs, which is pretty significant in, in many cases and can fill gaps in a lot of projects. I certainly understand why maybe the credit has not been utilized in Puerto Rico. There are complexities and um, art space is still learning lessons with regard to how to successfully you know, uh, deploy that credit. But we have done it now, and I'm gonna guess here, probably 15 to 20 times in different projects in our portfolio. So we have developed now kind of a, a sixth sense and an expertise around how to best utilize this credit. So I think the contribution right now that is in that we can make in the conversation in Puerto Rico is uh, understanding and accessing uh, U.S. you know federal resources uh, that can help advance some of their uh, community redevelopment and restoration goals. This particular site is again, interestingly enough, uh, a, uh, an old church. Uh, Catholic Church uh, that was also a nunnery at a time and a school, um, so it's got a it's a pretty big campus with several buildings, um, and the church, of course, is beloved in that community. Has been decommissioned um, by the Catholic mm -hmm. Church, so a sensitive and appropriate adaptive reuse is 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 what needs to happen with regard to the church itself, and then the other buildings can. You know, I think there's a growing uh, consensus that trying to do something there around affordable housing and art and cultural development and or education um, uh, and education, I should say, is kind of the, the rising theme uh, that the community is generating about what they would like to see on that site. So we are just now beginning kind of meaningful conversations about how we could potentially help uh, the community realize their vision and their hope for the site. And hopefully part of that will be identifying resources that maybe would not have been identified otherwise that can help with the redevelopment. So I'll take this back for a moment and just to talk a little bit about what we found when we surveyed creative people in San Juan. And we were very focused just on San Juan. We had support from the Mellon Foundation and they wanted us to, to continue our focus. So we surveyed uh, thousands of individual artists and found that over 300 were specifically interested in renting some kind of creative space for the over the long term. And so this is showing you the results of that. We did this during the pandemic. So it was all done virtually. It was our first time that we'd ever done both the feasibility study and the market study virtually, although there were some parties on the street, <laughs> uh, thanks to our local consultant that we were able to engage in to really uh, meet people who were uh, involved in create, creative activities. But the need for space is huge. So one of the other things that we looked at were other neighborhoods, right? So, so the Rio Piedras site was not the only neighborhood that we looked at. And we asked creative people in San Juan about their interests in space and where they'd like to be. And Santorce, Old San Juan, and Rio Piedras were the top three. That's probably not going to surprise anyone who's on this call from San Juan. Uh, they wanted to hear from the artists themselves. So where, where do they envision being? Where would they like to be? And then we wanted to also uh, give you a, a sense of what people were saying about why um, space for artists was important in these neighborhoods. Um, economic justice came up as a topic and fairness came up as a topic having something be a catalyst for other types of projects to happen. Um, Rio Piedras and Santurce were recognized as the largest cultural hubs. There was a strong need for artists live workspace as you saw from the numbers. And then just comments in general about the need for affordability uh, from San Juan creatives. Real estate challenges have been imposed by natural disasters. You all know that 
ownership is also important. So is there a way for us to think about ownership in addition to rent rental opportunities? Most of the resources that we know about that come from the federal government, for example, for affordable housing are rental uh, sources. But are there others that could be combined um, or could, could we combine that with some ownership opportunities? There's a history of spaces and organizations not surviving for things lasting for less than a decade. And there was some uh, frustration around that. There's a healthier market for art, both buying and selling than on the mainland. So that was also interesting for us to know and probably very obvious for many of you in the audience right now. And that there was a concern that existing artist spaces wouldn't survive COVID. Of course, this uh, these comments came last year, middle of the year. Uh, today, I hope there would be a little more optimism about that. So that ends our formal presentation about historic preservation, art space, our work across the mainland and in San Juan. Great presentation. <laughs> Thank you so much. Thank um, you. We are um, we're back. And before we jump into the question and answer session, I'm going to ask people to look at the tab above the screen, touch that button that says engage. And um, we are going to run another poll question. And Maria, if you could share that poll question. So what is your level of expertise with recycling properties? That's the poll question. So while you all are responding to that, let me just comment that um, I worked with ArtSpace many, many moons ago. I'm ashamed to say how many, <laughs> but back in the day, um, I remember that ArtSpace was doing brownfields redevelopment. ArtSpace was doing capital stacks for finance development. And ArtSpace was doing public-private partnerships before any of these concepts had really entered into the redevelopment vernacular. So I wanna say that you know, ArtSpace is truly a pioneer in this space and we're very, very pleased to have you with us today. Um, Will, you mentioned about the historic tax credits in Puerto Rico. Mm -hmm. And I have also wondered about historic tax credits in Puerto Rico because yeah. the Brownfields development work that we do here um, in the South in particular, we have many historic downtowns that reflect a beautiful sort of Criollo architectural style. Yeah. And um, it seems ripe for this kind of historic tax credit program. And I think maybe, and I'm wondering if you're finding this to be the case as well, that not only is the the challenge of just managing these tax credits because they are a little tricky to manage but i think that many of our local developers may not file federal taxes and so may not be able to actually realize the tax write-off from this historic tax credit directly on their um, tax tax forms on the local island but that they may not understand that there could be a mechanism for selling these tax credits on the secondary market that may provide financial benefit that they can then feed into the development of their property. Have you seen that? Um, I think that's true. I think there are there are a couple of different reasons. So I think probably local developers um, don't fully understand what the opportunities are under the pro under the program. And you are right; they can use uh, the benefit of the tax credits as a return on their own personal investment. Um, or they can syndicate those credits and, in effect, sell them to someone else. And what that typically looks like um, and it, is that you, you package their, your certificate. So when you apply for these tax credits uh, and they're criteria based, so you have to comply with all the design criteria uh, that is required to get those tax credits. Uh, and when the Park Service, these are issued through the Park Service uh, in, uh, section of the uh, part of the federal government, when the Park Service then issues a certificate, you can essentially sell that certificate to someone else. And typically that will garner 90 cents on the dollar. So if you if you got a million dollars in tax credits, that's going to generate $900,000 for you to use then in the capital stack on your project. So I think you're right. There's probably a misunderstanding um, or just an unknown, just not aware of this opportunity. 
Um, the criteria base, there's two other factors, I think, that, that maybe get in the way of people utilizing the, the credit. The other is that um, it, it does take a certain level of architectural expertise. So if the architectural community uh, on the island or in Puerto Rico isn't accustomed to what it takes to essentially move through that criteria-based application process, then even if you're a developer that's interested in using them, you might, you might not be able to easily find the architectural expertise that can help you navigate that application process. So I think that's another thing that maybe gets in the way of using the credit sometimes in Puerto Rico. And then the third is something that nobody can really control. And that is um, because it's criteria based and because you don't get the credit until you've built everything the way you said you would exactly. And the park service has pretty much carte blanche control to say, yes, you did or no, you didn't. You can't, you know, there's real risk in terms of your being able to secure the credit at the end of the deal after you've spent all your money. So if you're using an investor, your investor is very keen on what that risk means to them if they're committing to buy your credits. And um, so track record comes into play. And most investors, you know, don't want to risk um, an investment on a developer that doesn't have a really established track record. So, mm -hmm. you know, art space has that now. So we, any deal we do, we can pick from three or four different mm -hmm. and quite frankly, you know, ask them for the very best pricing they can offer. But if you're a first time developer doing this for the first time, you might not be able to get anyone quite frankly to even buy your credits just because you haven't demonstrated a track record. So I think all those things contribute to why it has not been commonly used in Puerto Rico in general. Um, and it's not just Puerto Rico. Those things are true for any developer in the States um, as well, um, I think in, in many cases. Thank you, Will. You know, to succeed with these complex funding programs, um, you, you've had many, many years of experience and you've seen this sort of funding um, incentives change over time as well. And a particular interest, I think, for the U.S. Caribbean is this availability of the Opportunity Zone tax credit. In, mm -hmm. in, in fact, EPA now um, has a point system when they're evaluating the Brownfields uh, proposals that get sent to them. If a project is in an Opportunity Zone, it kind of gets a, a little boost in the evaluative process. And so opportunity zones, I think by and large, all of Puerto Rico is an opportunity zone. And I believe that may be the case as well for the US Virgin Islands. Are there other kinds of new trends in financing of these projects uh, that you're seeing emerge that might be particular for our market? You know, that's it's an interesting question. I haven't seen new trends as, well, there are some new, maybe some new trends. What I, what I think we're seeing with the current administration though, is maybe not new trends as much as more resources, you know, kind of through the traditional paths that are there. So exactly. the historic tax credit, you know, is criteria based, um, you know, could it be a 25% credit and not a 20% credit, for example, would be really helpful. And there's discussion around that. Uh, on the affordable housing side, the 9% credit, which is the best affordable housing credit, is a very limited resource, you know, based on populations and doled out to, you know, states and to Puerto Rico. Um, so if they double those, the allocation of those credits, they could advance a lot more projects a lot more quickly. So I think the conversation's mostly been around depth and not so much about new initiatives with, when it comes to tools to use that we traditionally use. Um, and the Opportunity Zone the thing about the Opportunity Zone for I, that we have are learning and have learned is that the Opportunity Zone is is not the best nonprofit tool. It's a really good um, for profit developer tool. So I don't want I don't want to disparage it at all because it it really helps in kind of the near term uh, realization. But it does it does rely on a takeout, if you will, kind of a a for profit conversion on the back end to make the deal make sense. So if you're a nonprofit with kind of a sustainable mission 
as part of your aspiration. If you want to keep affordable housing, affordable housing for a really long time, it creates using that as a finance tool creates a boom, you know, at 15 or 20 year mark that you will have a hard time, right? Probably trying to refinance through or recapitalize through and still maintain your affordable housing mission if you have one. So for art space, it hasn't been the best tool. And um, uh, for that reason, simply because we typically commit when we're in community conversations about, you know, to long-term affordability. Excellent. It's great to know, especially because of the forces of gentrification that we're seeing also in the U.S. Caribbean. Yes. Um, um, we have a, a question here um, in the audience, and this actually uh, dovetails nicely with a, a question that I've got for you guys. Um, the person is asking, what is the criteria that you use to identify a site as an ideal site for art space? And I know, Wendy, you mm -hmm. have a very well-developed um, framework for actually mm -hmm. evaluating the potential for development that goes beyond just looking at a particular site, but looking at its mm -hmm. ecology, if you will, around it. Right. Talk a little bit more about that. You hinted at that in the presentation. Sure. So often we're evaluating multiple sites uh, when it really comes down to it, two or three typically. And the criteria that we use, sometimes we use a huge spreadsheet <laughs> and sometimes it's very small. But some of the key things that we're looking for are how it aligns with resources. So you wanna line up the site with the potential resources that you know you need to make the project possible. You also wanna make sure there's neighborhood and community support for that site. Uh, maybe it's a hot button and it's not one that you're going to be able to touch without a lot of engagement first, for example. How does it align with transit? Transit can be really important. Same with schools, same with grocery stores. So the, each state has what we call the qualified allocation plan and for the low income housing tax credits. And Puerto Rico has its own, for example. And it's also important to layer on that criteria on top of the things that I was just talking about. So sometimes the criteria can be pretty complex when it comes to thinking about all the things that you need to look at. But if you don't have that community support, that, that's pretty basic as a, as a beginning part. But then some sites like suburban sites may not be as easy to fund as core sort of downtown or um, neighborhood in you know higher density and intense neighborhood uh, sites like in, in El Barrio. Thank you. Thank you for that. Just to get back to our poll, um, the people in the audience, um, we had asked them what their expertise was around this sort of uh, placemaking and, and, and redevelopment. And uh, we've got about 13% that consider themselves experts. So that's a pretty good share. 29% um, they have a bit of experience. 43% say they're just starting out and 22% said they're definitely newbies. So um, that's great. We can attend to all of those things here. Um, are there any particular statutory or zoning challenges for these developments or policy challenges that typically have to be addressed? Will, you want to take it? <laughs> yes. Yes. <laughs> what, what, what threads are you seeing in common? What do you anticipate yes. might be those challenges here in the Caribbean? Well, there, there are a couple of things. And when I, when I, as I'm learning in, in Puerto Rico, um, the sources we use are, are heavily governed, right? As Wendy mentioned, first by the federal government through section 42, right? Which brings a regulatory you know, structure to all the affordable housing tax credits. And then those, but and those funnel to a state which layer on their own regulatory agreement, right? With, you know, and they either double down or expand uh, the regulatory requirements of utilizing that resource in a project. So you're constantly trying to um, and then as you bring other agendas, so we've had plenty of experiences where we will have a design criteria for a number of bedrooms or configuration of bedrooms or size of bedrooms that directly, and then we're in a historic building, right, that has a certain dimension of windows, right? So you have to have a window, um, and to capture a window in this particular adaptive reuse for historic tax credits, 
you end up making a slightly bigger bedroom than the limit on the affordable housing criteria for bedroom sizes, right? So these, these regulations do not always align. So we're constantly in this conversation about we get it, right? And we're all trying to get the same place and we want to preserve this wonderful mm. structure and we also want to deliver on affordable housing. One's not going to happen without the other. So we got to get to the table, but these are bureaucracies and it's hard to get people to compromise. It's hard to find, you know, get and advance variances on these criteria when they, you know, conflict specifically. So that's one layer that we uh, are constantly, I think, struggling with as we try to meld, uh, you know, different resources together and meet all of their requirements, get everything to work together. The other thing that's interesting specifically, I think, about Puerto Rico and probably the Caribbean in general is that the affordable housing tax credits are very much based on this notion about area median income. And for those of you that aren't familiar with that phrase, it's basically uh, on a kind of a, a municipal basis so that, you know, think towns, cities, counties, you know, smaller areas, the federal government averages the incomes of all the people in these municipalities and they come up with an you know an average income for that community and then they base and set rents based on that area median income data and uh, and then they will fix a rental amount for your project so what's interesting in some communities in puerto rico that are that should, right, should, if you're trying to think about it, are our hardest hit, most economically challenged communities, right? And um, th they should be first in line, in my humble view, right, for opportunities around these resources. And yet, because the communities are poor, their area median income is really low. So it fixes a rental rate really low, which sounds great. You know, maybe it's like 100 bucks a month. Um, but the trouble is, if you have a 50 unit building at 100 bucks a month, you honestly can't even just operate that building, even if it has no debt, right? So even if you were able to find a capital stack that was 100% subsidized and build this thing and then rent it at those rents, you just couldn't keep the lights on or the air conditioning or you know, the maintenance of the space or staff the building uh, in any kind of reasonable way. So you, the requirements force you into what is essentially an operating scenario that loses money. So the, the interesting thing about that is they don't change the formula. The federal government won't change the formula. So instead, the answer becomes creating kind of a sinking fund that you capitalize on the front end that subsidizes a loss for a period of 15 or 20 years. And then there's a cliff there that nobody really deals with, right? You know, that you kind of have to deal with when you get there. Um, so this is, these are some challenges that we're discovering that are unique, uh, at least to our work in Puerto Rico at this point, that has been different than most of our work uh, in, in, in the States in the mainland. Thanks. Um, we've got a, a question here from the audience, and I think um, you've touched on this, but maybe you could go a little bit deeper into this idea, Wendy. Um, when you come into a new city, obviously you you evaluate the local ecology that will support mm -hmm. this kind of development, and you're very much community centric in terms of identifying as well local community partners. And um, so the question here is, when you move into a new city, what do you do to actually build a foundation of trust that allows that collaboration to um, to to happen? And in particularly where um, some communities, perhaps in Puerto Rico or the U.S. Virgin Islands, may also um, have a particular cultural uh, style and a cultural divide um, that you also have to bridge. Can you talk about that? Because Minnesota is quite a quite a different place for sure. And you've worked sure. everywhere, so you know. Sure. Yeah. Yes, I, lo I love that topic because I always feel like I'm a bit of an anthropologist <laughs> thinking about all the different places and, and unique situations. What What's really unique about art space is that we're invited into communities. Now, sometimes that invitation comes from a foundation. So that is very top down 
right? And sometimes that invitation comes from a community group. And then it's very much, you know, community driven right from the start. But either way, it's really important to have local people, uh, a core group of local people be your ambassadors, right? And you need to do a lot of listening and you need to be very respectful of what has become before you and make sure that those voices are at the table, as many diverse voices as possible from different sectors of the community. So that's why it takes some time to do these feasibility studies and really get to know a community before we come in as outsiders, because we don't want to be perceived as outsiders, even though we are. We want to really work with local nonprofits, government, chambers, artist groups, et cetera, to make it as seamless and graceful as possible. You know, um, on, on a follow on to that, I mean, we've been speaking basically about project initiation, mm -hmm. um, but when we think about the long-term experience you've had, okay, so I'm gonna give up the, the, the dates here, the um, lower town 30 years ago, the lower town development <laughs> in St. Paul um, was in a part of the city that was just to say abandoned in essence. And this project served as an anchor. I haven't been back in a few years, but I'm imagining that it's even more of a strong anchor in that community. Mm -hmm. um, and, and that there is a, a very um, diverse level of incomes that was there at that time when the project went into place and probably that's continuing. So you don't have to use that as the example, but um, when we're thinking about community ownership of these projects over a long period of time. Can you talk about how art space sort of vision and the use of these sites with the particular kind of tenants or space users that you have um, integrates with the local community over the long term? I, I think that when I recall your projects, I, I think that they are catalytic projects. And, and serve as a basis for community revitalization because of the nature of the, the cultural workers that are now in those spaces. But um, what, what do you do to kind of ensure that that process is, is um, smooth and, and that, the, that there is actual true integration, that these aren't projects that are separate from what else is happening in the local community? You go ahead, Will. All right, I can, I can start. You, you beat me by eight years, so. <laughs> <laughs> well, thanks. Um, <laughs> um, you know, I think, you know, we work very hard, um, first of all, to pick up on Wendy's point, right? The whole point of our work is to advance the aspirations of the communities in which we work, right? So we just don't bring any, we just don't bring our own agenda, right? And, and we'll happily, and if, if what we can help with isn't uh, what we do, we will happily, you know, stand down or go someplace else, right? So, so it makes it pretty easy because as our projects come online, um, and you know, I think the community already has a high degree of sort of vested sense of ownership in that project right out of the gate, right? In a pretty extraordinary kind of way. So our job is just not to mess that up at that point, right? And and to encourage uh, uh, the artists in our building, the creatives in our building, whether individuals or organizations, to engage and contribute in that community uh, as deeply as they can manage. And so that's our refrain all the time is to, so we encourage things like, you know, open studio nights where a series of artists will open their homes up and invite the public in for an event to view and even maybe I, we hope purchase uh, their art. So those kinds of engagement activities, uh, we support uh, with our asset team, which is a team of people at ArtSpace that basically is there to help guide these buildings during their operational phase. So um, we, so, so I think, you know, in a perfect world, they just sort of become part of the fabric that people sort of you know, identify as their neighborhood and uh, and and who did it or how it got done, quite frankly, isn't really important after a few years. It just feels like a community asset. And um, and that's that's what we, I think, strive to do in terms of our operational phase. We couple that then with kind of a financial strategy 
It is about long-term affordability and long-term stewardship. So as a general rule, we're not looking, you know, to liquidate projects, right? We are looking to sort of just be responsible stewards of those projects, you know, into perpetuity if possible. Now that said, there are circumstances where we let go of projects. Sometimes there's a local partner, right? That, you know, grows and matures um, and into an organization that can very effectively manage that stewardship. And then we will maybe exit that project in favor of that local partner. And, and there are, you know, potentially other circumstances in which we might hand off the stewardship of some of these projects, you know, to other partners. But as a general rule, when we enter the conversation, you know, we see ourselves as very long-term uh, participants in the stewardship of that asset. Sure. Thank you for that. You know, as, as the U.S., Virgin Islands, and Puerto Rico continue to rebuild after this just terrible cascade of disasters we've, yes. we've all lived through, um, we really have the opportunity right now to rethink as communities how we want our futures to be and what kind of community goods and community services for collected benefits we want to see. Mm -hmm. um, I'm wondering if you might be able to share with us an example of how this catalytic adaptive reuse has really generated community benefits, perhaps thinking about before and after contrasting for us. Mm. Well, I think we can both, <clears throat> both speak to that, of course. I think one of the biggest things that we learned from that economic impact study that we did about a, 10 years ago is that creatives were able to make more income from their creative pursuit as a result of living and working in these environments. And Wendy, and that, question, Wendy just to interrupt for a second, that, that, yeah. that those creatives are people who actually were living in the community beforehand, or these people have come in from the outside to occupy Both. these spaces? Both. A little of each. A little okay. of each, yeah. All right. I mean, in Lower Town St. Paul that you referenced before, that was an abandoned neighborhood. And so the artists were the first to occupy, reoccupy the spaces post-industrial United States. But in most cases today, it's a combination of people who were already there before and newer people coming in. I mean, Will talked about how 75% of our applicants for PS109 in El Barrio came from El Barrio, right? So only 25% came from outside of there and they might've only come from outside just a tiny little bit, <laughs> right? They weren't coming from Chicago or LA right. or other big cities. And, and that's so it wasn't, a that, it wasn't a gentrification force you were saying? No. Yes, no. exactly, exactly. So I think the most important thing about these projects is that they're stabilizing and enabling artists to really succeed and be recognized for the creative people that they are. So, you know, being an artist is an occupation, even though that's not recognized at the federal level, it's something that's, that's very important for us to recognize and for us to try to um, encourage and, uh, uh, you know, have them be successful. Right. Thank you. Thank you. That's so compelling. And, you know, you've identified that these projects also provide this economic benefit, including probably jobs during their actual physical build out. And so I'm wondering about the local hiring. You know, EPA has this Brownfields Jobs Training Program, which actually mm -hmm. we're going to be speaking about in the <clears throat> two o'clock session. And it's been a great success for promoting both work force development, but also environmental justice through the local participation and job creation. When you guys are coming into a, a, a new market, um, how are you working the local um, professional workforce into your projects? Well, we always, we always hire a local contractor, right, uh, is, is part of what we do. Um, we also always uh, willingly and, um, you know, so sometimes there are you know, there are requirements with some of our financial resources to uh, enter into covenants around, you know, targeted local uh, labor. Sure. Work, right? So, Will, we've got this interesting dynamic here because we are in recovery. So we've got all this CDBG disaster recovery, FEMA disaster recovery, all of these federal funds coming in. And what right. we're seeing is this uh, disaster capitalism where from the mainland, a corporation mm -hmm. will come in, establish itself locally, maybe not hire locally. Yeah. Um, or I if mean, they do hire locally, pay very poor wage. 
and right. import, you know, the higher level talent. Yeah. Um, so you're not, obviously not talking about doing anything like that. You'll bet not, these folks. Not at all. What I was yeah. referencing really is those, those programs that are there. Right. And right. it can be manipulated. Um, and they often are, um, but we try to embrace those principles in, in a voluntary kind of way. So we always say yes, but then we try to uh, go beyond that. And we try to work with local partners to identify, uh, you know, labor that is in the community that can participate in our projects. And um, so we're constantly working with our local contractor. We're constantly asking those questions. We're constantly trying to reach out to job training programs that are either local or regional to I try to identify people that can work on our sites. So this is kind of an ongoing part of what we do. Uh, again, we view that as sort of a, uh, you know, a responsible approach to community development um, in a broader context uh, that we think is important to our overall mission. So um, interestingly enough, also developing here in the Caribbean are workforces that actually can do the, the do the um, reconstruction of historic properties using the techniques in which they were built, and so mm -hmm. these are techniques mm -hmm. that were lost over time, and so now there are new labor forces uh -huh. emerging both in the in the USDI and in Puerto Rico with the assistance of the I think the US uh, uh, Forestry Service because they have this kind of element too. Yeah. Well, we're 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 kind of running out of time, and we've gone over time a bit. And it's just been delightful to speak with you both and uh, to share your knowledge and expertise with our audience today. For those of, of the people who are in our audience today that might be interested in engaging in art space, um, could you talk to us just briefly about the kind of services that you offer in terms of consulting and how uh, an organization might actually reach out and, and engage? Sure. <clears throat> you can put my email in, in the public chat, if you don't mind. Sure. Uh, but, the, but the kinds of things that uh, we do, we do feasibility studies for potential future projects, whether or not it's the community that ends up doing the project themselves or art space. We do these feasibility studies that I talked about. We also provide a lot of technical assistance to both developers and nonprofit arts organizations who are doing their own projects. So we can help them from everything from the project concept to the financing to how do you communicate about uh, the project and find the audience for that project. So really, it's everything that I talked to, spoke about in the slides. And so we'd be happy to engage. Thank you. Sure. Thank you. Well, um, I very much appreciate your time with us today. Do you have any closing thoughts you'd like to share before we go? Just thank you, uh, David, thank you. Uh, for hosting this and uh, continuing the conversation, such an important conversation and, and, uh, and trying to advance, you know, meaningful uh, and, and locally driven, right? And locally responsible redevelopment in the Caribbean in general and in Puerto Rico is so important. And I hope, uh, I hope that we can all work together to do more of that in the coming years. Well, you can certainly count on CClear if you guys need assistance in doing a targeted brownfield assessment. We can connect those dots for you uh, and connect you also with community organizations and local contacts here on the island. Thank you very much for being with us today. Please stay well and enjoy you. your soon-to-be weekend. <laughs> you too. Bye-bye. Right.